so um, this is a part two of uh, a workshop that the United Workers has been, been doing. Um, and the first workshop we did was yesterday. Um, if you didn't come to that, it's okay. It, uh, they're kind of two different uh, strategies that we're talking about. But um, overall, um, this is kind of new for us in a way um, to be sharing so much in depth kind of the United Workers organizing model and strategy. But given the, the name of the conference and I think the intention of the organizers is really this was a space to share different models and strategies. And so um, yesterday we kind of did an overview of uh, our organizing model, kind of situating ourselves within um, a history of poor people's movements in this country and talked a, a lot about sort of our, our pedagogical model and how these processes um, are applied on the ground, so how this model gets applied. So this is part two, and we're talking specifically about um, one strategy in, in particular that um, is really important to us, called the Battle of Stories Framework. And so, uh, anyways, I'll hand it off to Kieran. Hi everyone, um, my name's Kieran. Oh, did I introduce myself? No, I, I don't think I did. I'm <laughs> Ashley Huffnagel. I'm a, a leadership organizer with the United Workers. And hi everyone, my name is Kieran. I'm new to the Leadership Council. Recently been um, with United Workers for over a year now. Um, the Battle of the Story, the one strategy that we use is called the Battle of the Stories Framework. And this, the Battle of the Stories Framework, is a strategy for building power and developing leadership. And in this framework, workers are authors of constructive stories that draw attention to our cause convey meaning, and celebrate human rights values. Essentially, we are applying a narrative structure to our campaigns. Stories are written and carried out in anticipation of later chapters, one action leads to another. Now, some of these actions might not be for a year later, but yet, we do it anyway, so that way, we're ready for it. And this last point is very important. Authorship is intentional and requires agency. So this pretty much means that we are the authors of our own stories. Because if we're not the authors of our own stories, we're not going to get our point across. And with our timeline and our international like history, this requires power. So next slide. What is a narrative? Can anyone tell me what a narrative is in your own terms? OK. <laughs> well, narrative, just like this picture that we have here. And I'm, Pretty sure everyone knows what it is. <laughs> this is a narrative. Next slide, please. Sorry. <laughs> and also, this is a narrative. <laughs> Next slide. And this. And also this. Yeah. <laughs> so, narrative. What does narrative do? Narrative drives culture. Governments and corporations hire experts, experts, storytellers, to write and perform narratives. Narratives are news, entertainment, politics, and advertising. History is a narrative. Great religions and faith traditions are narrative-based. So these social movements are told through narratives, and narratives carry ideas and express values. And this is why like, this is simply why government corporations get experts to do this. They know that they want to get their message across, and the best way to do that is to hire experts. So, four, what are the elements of a narrative? Elements of a narrative are scenes, character, that, <laughs> actions across time, it relates to the viewer, uh, the voice of the teller, and it leads to a point. And all these element, elements are sim seem simple, but they're really not. Trying to convey these messages aren't always the easiest thing. So that's why, again, we, we get these experts. Like that, that point is so big. We get these experts to do it because they have this way where they can convey a story. And when government corporations want to convey a story, they want to make sure that, oh, it's this side of the story. And the best way they can get that is by saying, let's get an expert in here. So it doesn't seem like anyone else has a story. They have their own story, and they're going to stick to it. So also, this is narrative. 
before I was showing you, we showed you a bunch of like commercial narratives, but also there's narrative in history, like this, next slide. And this, and this, and this narrative is our story, fighting for poverty and human rights for everyone. Ashley. Next slide, please. Okay, so, um, so we've kind of taken these elements of, of narrative that we saw before with the scenes, the characters, and all that, and kind of developed our own framework around narrative. Um, and it, it consists of these, these elements, vision, values, narrative, people, and action. Um, and this is, this is a strategic framework that helps us construct a campaign, construct a campaign as a story, an epic story between, um, um, between a protagonist and, and our opponent. Um, and so, um, so we'll kind of break down some of these elements. Okay, um, so the vision, um, the function of the vision is that it leads us to a point. Um, and there's criteria for each of these, uh, these different elements. Um, and these criteria are, are critical to, uh, to this element functioning effectively. So the criteria are that it's concrete, it's important, and it's challenging. So um, for us, our vision, the United Workers' vision, is uh, building a movement um, to secure economic human rights for all. So, um, so it's concrete. You know, we have a list of, uh, of demands. It's economic human rights. Um, it's something tangible that you know you can you can point to. Um, it's important because it meets people's needs. And then it's challenging because uh, many people don't even think that we can do that. You know, it's, it's, it's obviously not, we're not saying, you know, that um, it's not an easy vision to get. It's obviously something that is going to be really challenging to get. So, uh, next slide. Um, so, and then we have our values. Um, and. It, the, the values function as like the moral of the story. And for us in this framework, the criteria for that are that they're transformative, they're universal, and they're personal. And so for us, the United Workers values are human rights values, respect, dignity, um, sanctity of life. And um, by transformative, um, that by transformative we mean that these values not only transform this larger, this larger system, but also tra are transformative on the personal level as well. And that um, it's different from transactional. transactional. We're, we're not appealing to people based on self-interest. We're appealing to people based on this desire to create a change, to transform themselves and society. Um, and then universal in that it applies to, to everyone. And, and no one um, is excluded from this. And so that really broadens who can relate to this story. And then um, personal. So we're not just talking about um, this story on this kind of larger societal level. We're talking about a story that's a personal story that how this this actually affects uh, real people. Um, and so um, uh, so that's really important part of it that is, that is personal. Um, that's that. um, okay. So narrative um, is. is essentially the, the story structure. Um, and part of the criteria is that it in, integrates with other organizing essentials. Um, and it includes all of the, the narrative components that we talked about, like the scenes, characters, you know, all of that stuff, creating the structure of the narrative. Um, next slide. So I wanted to just touch on this point, because the Valley School Framework is a strategy that we use. There are many core strategies in the United Workers, and organizing is more than just storytelling. Um, and so this framework has to um, you know, take into account lots of other organizing essentials. So developing leaders, you know, having a, a sustainable <laughs> revenue model, um, you know, doing operations, non-narrative cycles like perhaps governing cycles or something like that. Um, coalition and power politics. You know, there might be a, a situation where you know uh, we're working with coalition partners, and the particular story doesn't fit with how they frame an issue. So you know you have to take that into account. Um, and then 
strategic planning and being focused, um, the battle of stories framework really isn't effective if you don't even have this, this, this last thing. If you don't do strategic planning, if you're not focused. Um, so without a strategy, it's, it's kind of, um, it, it doesn't work. So just wanted to put that in because it's not just, that there's a lot more going on. So, okay, next slide. So another element is people. Um, and so the function of, uh, of people are their history as participants. And for us, um, um, this, this includes a lot of different people, but um, we focus on uh, people who are personally affected by the problem. Um, are the people that are the authors of the story. Um, and uh, we build on people united by a cause. And it must include a strong opponent. The story is not really interesting um, if there isn't a conflict um, between um, uh, between the, the people who are personally affected and some sort of opponent that is uh, a part of uh, creating a system that we're critiquing. Um, and uh, so you know, but you know, there's lots of people that are part of the story. So they're personally affected, perhaps some uh, allies of some sort or other. You know, people might fit into that category, and then you have the opponent. Um, okay, next slide. Um, action. Um, so the function is to derive meaning, to build community, um, and create history. So um, the criteria for this is do, don't, say. Um, so you, you have to, um, you know, you can't just kind of say, you know, we just, we want economic human rights, and that's kind of where it ends, you know, you have to act in a way that kind of illustrates the story. Um, we're actors, we're, and we're playing out this story. Um, so you want to render it with concrete details. Um, and it, uh, it also integrates with other essentials, um, particularly like leadership development, you know, how are these actions that we're doing a part of the leadership development process. So, um, I'm not so sure how many, just like a raise of hands, how many people are familiar with the United Workers? Okay, cool. And, um, okay, so just for those of you who aren't, um, so the United Workers, uh, your, our current campaign is the Human Rights Zone campaign at Baltimore's Inner Harbor. Um, so we're organizing workers um, at the Inner Harbor from uh, the Cheesecake Factory to Uno's to uh, Hooters, you know, all, all, of, all, all together. And um, we're, we're targeting the developers that control the Inner Harbor, and we're demanding a right to work with dignity, a right to health care, and a right to education. So just to give you a little background. So how we apply the, um, the Human Rights Zone campaign to the Inner Harbor. So our vision is uh, rights to health care, education, and work with dignity secured for every low-wage worker at the Inner Harbor. Um, our values are respect for all, dignity for all, safety of life. Um, I'll touch on the narrative in the next slide. And then the people are low-wage workers, harbor employers, um, the particular vendors like Cheesecake Factory, or, um, and then the developers, um, which at the Inner Harbor, Cordish and GGP, and then um, community allies as well. And so, get to the next slide. So, um, you know, again, uh, we have this narrative structure, scenes, characters, action across time, relates to the viewer, the voice of the teller, and leads to a point. So, with the scene part, um, you know, the scene for us is the inner harbor. And this, this is actually uh, much more of an element within this campaign than, say, a living wages campaign at Camden Yards. Um, because we've, we've, we've declared a whole geographic area a human rights zone. And uh, this, the inner harbor is very symbolic for Baltimore. It's, it's our main tourist attraction. It's in the heart of the city. Um, and so that itself as an element within the story is has really been potent and important. Um, the characters are, um, as we said before, are uh, harbor workers, um, which you'll see in the next slides. You know, some of the, um, the particular uh, leaders from the, this campaign. Um, and then uh, in the next slide we'll talk about some of the actions. Um, now, just one thing to say about this is like, 
what is so important about this strategic framework is that we are writing the story and we're controlling the narrative. So often um, with, uh, you know, we're being attacked on so many levels and we're, you know, often responding to these attacks, whether, attacks, whether it's like, you know, rec centers closing or, um, you know, uh, attacks on workers' rights. Um, kind of, you know, we see this kind of backlash happening in this, in this um, and so it's really important for us to proactively put forward campaigns that are not just responding um, to our opponent's timeline and being kind of pulled in different directions, that we're actually putting forward the timeline, yeah. controlling the timeline, and how we're act acting towards it. Um, so, um, next slide. Okay, so just some of the actions that we've taken so far just to kind of tell the story. So um, our first campaign was the Living Wages campaign at Camden Yards Baseball Stadium, where we organized the day laborers that clean the stadium. And we fought for three years and won a living wage um, in 2007. And after that victory, um, we marched from Camden Yards to the Inner Harbor and declared the Inner Harbor a human rights zone. So that was the beginning of launching the campaign. So um, we didn't just, you know, say, we've got this new campaign, guys, you know? We, like, we performed the story, we acted it out, we, 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 we did it, we didn't say, we marched from Camden Yards to the Inner Harbor to show this, <coughs> extend and expand from Camden Yards to this new campaign, and we kind of did this action of declaring it a human rights to, to, to illustrate that, that, um, that part of the story. And then um, workers, um, after uh, attempting to go after one of the um, one of the restaurants at the Inner Harbor, Philip Seafood, um, uh, and, and, and workers, uh, the Philip's reaction was kind of to threaten workers and tell them they would shut down the restaurant if workers got organized. And so workers came together and decided that. Um, instead of going from restaurant to restaurant to restaurant that would take forever, they wanted to go after one united target that would include everyone at the Inner Harbor. So they decided um, to shift their demands to the developers who were at the top of the profit chain. And so in order to um, illustrate this shift, um, workers uh, uh, developed a skit um, that involved um, the two developers um, kind of in suits and like ladders of money um, on top of big ladders and um, on the bottom there were uh, workers and then there were the different sort of vendors um, Cheesecake Factory and, and, um, and ESPN Zone and Hard Rock Cafe that were exploiting workers and while the, the developers at the top were you know were profiting off of this and so um, so they t did this get to sort of educate and to illustrate you know this this profit chain um, and, and then they also uh, mailed a letter to the developers um, from uh, a post office in Immokalee, Florida um, while we were on this Fair Food Solidarity tour with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers and um, so we have you know photos of that you know us signing the, everyone signing the letter and mailing it off to the developers um, and then there were repeated attempts to bring the developers, um, PGP and Cordish, to the table. We went up to, um, all the way up to Chicago um, on our Poverty Zone Reality Tour, and to and a delegation uh, hand delivered the letter um, to uh, to GGP just in case you know they didn't get it before. This was like a year later after we had mailed the letter and hadn't heard anything. Um, and we were told, uh, we wanted to talk to a top executive there and hand the letter off, and we were told that, um, like at 3 o'clock, they, 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 no one was there, they'd all left, you know, so, um, I know they're working really hard. Um, so, um, and then, um, two years, on the two-year anniversary of December 10th, Human Rights Day, um, that was the day that we had mailed the letters uh, to the developers from this post office in Immokalee, Florida. Um, on that anniversary, two year anniversary, we did a mass letter drop, um, throwing uh, about 8,000 copies of the letter um, off the balconies of the gallery mall down at our, our own, it's owned by GGP. Um, and that kind of kicked off a ramp up uh, against uh, 
GGP. And then there was letter drops at uh, GGP malls around the country, because they're the, one of the sec they're the second largest mall owner in the country, and other sort of flash mob solidarity actions that happen. Um, and then just a couple weeks ago, on May 19th, we had a four-mile march um, uh, through the city to the Inner Harbor to occupy the Harbor Mall. And um, we, uh, we passed another one of GGP's mall along the way and actually marched through uh, Mondaman Mall, which is in West Baltimore, and through the, the mall and out, and then uh, marched down Pennsylvania Avenue, which is um, kind of uh, Baltimore's historic African enter African American entertainment kind of corridor that, where um, Billie Holiday used to perform. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really kind of important um, and symbolic street in Baltimore, and there was an incredible amount of community support, pretty, pretty amazing. And then um, all the way to the Inner Harbor, and when we got to the Inner Harbor, GGP's reaction was to actually just shut down the mall with consumers inside the mall trying to get out of the doors. <laughs> and uh, people trying to get in, like, I gotta get into Urban Outfitters, you know, and the doors locked. You know? so, um, so they literally shut down the mall so that, um, so that they didn't, that was their response. Um, to, to our demands. Um, and just to add a comment yeah. onto that, um, during this march, we, I mean, I've been, again, as long as I've been with the United Workers over a little over a year, and during this march, this is my favorite one, I did a couple actions, but during this march, it's kind of my favorite because I've never seen the police actually, during our march, when we started, the police actually helped us in a way. <laughs> they were leading traffic, like, hold up, stop, and everything, and when we got to the harbor, I heard this comment from one of the, like, you know, the police workers, I think that's what they are. Yeah. Um, but they were like, I'm actually glad you're doing this because we don't get paid that much either. Like, you're showing everything about the malls and this and that, but yet, I wish I could join you. And I was like, <laughs> like, and it, it just really, this March, most of all, I mean, being four miles, but then hearing stuff like that really, touched me and it's just like, wow, like we're really making an impact. And that's what we fight for, to make an impact and for like, people to see that we're trying to help everyone, not, and not just one person. Yeah. It affects us all. So. And, and I think that that is, um, th that message, because it's the values mm -hmm. and it being universal, it's relatable to so many people, mm -hmm. that this police officer didn't see this as like an antagonistic like uh, march toward them, but rather they understood the message um, and shared that and shared those values. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a really good example. All right, uh, next slide. Please. Okay, yeah. So, um, so cool. So that's kind of basically uh, an overview of the framework. I do have like a one, a two pages. Um, one kind of says a lot of what I just talked about, but also uh, this other one kind of breaks it down into. Uh, this little chart. Um, so we're going to do some breakouts in a, in a, in a minute. Wait, let's see. Yeah. Okay, cool. But before we do that, I do want to show um, a video that kind of um, that has a lot of these elements um, of the framework. Now, just to let you know, I mean, the framework is more than just like how to how to put together a constructive video. It's really about how to construct a whole campaign. So it's, it's more of a strategic framework. But um, you know, it does. You can't see it manifested in this this video. So I do want to show the video and then maybe have um, a little some conversation. About that. Yeah. And this video is from the, our recent action from the former mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> you could turn up the uh, the knob on the volume. The volume knob there. You want to try it again? Yeah. Anyone who just came in or um, hasn't been, I'm going to have you sign it.
GGP is the second largest mall owner in the country. They own several malls uh, in Baltimore. Mon Darman, uh with the entire Inner Harbor. GGP, we've been trying to get in touch with them, have a face-to-face -face dialogue for over two years, and for two years, uh, they've been ignoring us. Nosotros estamos exigiendo nuestros derechos como trabajadores en Inner Harbor porque uh, en Inner Harbor hay muchas injusticias como robo de salario, no tener acceso a la educación, no, no tener aseguranza médica y también este, uh, ser tratados como, uh, con falta de respeto. Por ejemplo, yo fui trabajadora de Cheesecake Factory, uh, ahí hay muchos abusos, entonces este, ahí... Este, Ellos piensan que nosotros somos máquinas, que no, no podemos este, tener sentimientos y nos tratan como, que, como inhumanos, o sea que... Well, today we marched from uh, Mondarm and Mall, marching all the way down to uh, the gallery um, at the Inner Harbor, and we're doing this because, uh, you know, we're just tired of being mistreated. I've seen people reading the flyers and people uh, driving by honking their horns. You know, people uh, have come up and said that, you know, that they will tell everybody that they know and uh, have them come down uh, to the harbor. We want uh, the right to education, we want the right to health care, we want the right to a living wage of at least eleven twenty-five or better. We want to work with dignity and respect. And we also want uh, GGP to uh, sign a uh, fair development agreement which states that that uh, their vendors would treat their uh, employees with dignity and respect and that they, they will also uh, comply with uh, the bank. All in my neighborhood, I'm let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Por eso que nosotros estamos haciendo esta marcha para que así él vea que no solo nosotros estamos luchando, para que nosotros tengamos un, un cambio en nuestras vidas y también para las vidas de los niños del futuro. between 
um, you know, fighting for the rights of these, this particular group of workers, um, but, you know, in the hopes of creating a better future for the kids of our city. Yeah. Yeah. of like four or five and um, what we're going to do is um, we're going to give you guys like a just a, a scenario um, for instance one group might be talking about housing foreclosures just as an example and we're going to have you kind of create a little chart like this vision values narrative people in action and, and fill out those those categories of that. Um, and then we're going to have you come back and kind of share what you're able to construct <laughs> using this. So, um, um, so I don't know, let me use an example. Um, yeah, so I mean, I don't want to, you know, say anything, but um, that will. Um, you from coming up with your own stuff. But um, yeah, so kind of if it's housing foreclosure, what is the ultimate you know, goal of this? What's the vision around um, housing, this issue around housing foreclosure? Um, you know, not necessarily like what your particular you know, demand is necessarily, it could be something broader. Um, and then sort of what are the values that um, are underpinning this story? Uh, and then the, the narrative, um, just kind of the different elements of the, the scenes, the characters, the structure of it, um, and um, people, um, you know, who would be the people that would be a part of this story around foreclosure? Um, who would be the, um, kind of, who would be the author of this story? Who would be the opponent? Who might be some of the other characters that are involved in that story? And then, um, kind of, what would be some of the actions um, that you could see taking place? And, and for the narrative, maybe, um, Maybe you know. It, maybe you want to leave this one for for last. It might be easier to kind of build out some of these other ones, and then figure out how you can maybe plot this kind of into a, a longer story. Um, does that make sense? Okay. Cool. Um. Early in the morning, the job's begun. Job number two comes at a quarter to one. Take the bus down and wait in the hot sun. You'll be feeling tired from the morning. Two hours turns the clock. Waiting in line at the auction block. Economic systems got you locked. Got you waking too early in the morning. Paycheck comes and it's nothing new You work six hours, got paid for two Buy a cheap dinner for your kids and you And you'll spend it all by the morning Settling now for minimum wage Waiting for the day when you turn the page It's bound to happen one of these days It'll bring a brand new morning Gonna build power with your working hands Organize and make demands If they refuse, you're gonna take a stand And they're gonna feel it in the morning And once that living wage is won There'll be dignity and power in the stadium And you'll keep organizing till it's worker run It'll bring a brand new morning
like having to make sacrifices in terms of you know your future, uh, critical con consciousness, and education for its own sake. Um, so the narrative we came up with was to graduate from student debt. Um, each struggle is a, it's like an exam, you know. Uh, <laughs> and then the journey isn't complete until we can be free in education. Um, so it's like, you know, you graduate from school, but then 30 years down the line, you really graduate from the debt. Um, people, so we're fighting for the right for freedom and education. Students um, are, so these are all sort of the uh, stakeholders, I guess, students, dropouts, banks, university administration, faculty, families, um, communities, you know, all of us together, uh, governments, like, uh, and then workers as well, workers at the university. And then actions for like campaigns, debt strike, walkouts, um, petitions, the idea of, you know, because as an individual, um, to not pay your student debt is like a, a big risk, an individual risk, but having lots of people together um, creates more power. Um, and then education about debt. A lot of people going into school don't even realize what they're getting themselves into. And then another action would be just to create a free university that, you know, don't have to worry about debt. You can just education through plot. And does anyone want to add anything else? From that like 
it might even be appropriate not to have a narrative as like people who are auditioning to you know this hypothetical situation mobilize this campaign is because the narrative is going to come out of a lot of people's narratives. So maybe that might be a way to look at it, not having a narrative yet. All right, so uh, first we, we very quickly decided that we had a, a shared vision of uh, equally, ecologically responsible uh, energy generation. And what we meant probably by that was uh, the huge geothermal potential that exists in Appalachia, which is probably as powerful and longer term than its coal generation. But we also want to touch on wind and hydro and the Tennessee Valley Authority and the like that. So uh, then we went into our values. Um, in addition to the vision, um, it was like recognizing that the um, people seeking jobs and, the, and the, like you said, energy energy generation, um, that those are things that we need. And so we're not looking at, you know, fighting against, not talking about what we're looking at something positive. Right. We want to have a positive uh, goal, not just stop this, but what can we do as an alternative. And in talking about that, our alternatives we needed to respect and prop, uh, respect and gratitude for the earth and the people. The emphasis on the people came up a lot. So it was some sort of social ecology. And so part of that needed to be that there would be needed to be good jobs as 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 compared to not good, unsafe jobs that had poor wages. And so that needed to be economic, environmentally, uh, uh, responsibility and sustainability. Um, we actually didn't do narrative till last. So we'll <laughs> Um, so in terms of the people, we talked about um, the residents uh, of, of those areas that are affected, the workers who are also often residents of those communities and, and you know, environmentally affected by the issues. Um, the owners of the company that are um, extracting the coal, banks that finance the companies, uh, energy consumers, which is us, um, politicians who would enable them to do that, um, in, our, in this situation, the animals who live in those areas are also actors. And um, the um, allies, anybody who comes from you know, anywhere, whether directly, um, in, immediately affected or not, who care about the issue, and um, yeah, those being environmentalists. So um, we had a lot of actions that we were, were talking about doing. One was a, an effort to say divest from banks that support mountaintop removal, but conversely to start a dialogue with banks about how they should be doing more responsible investment. Why are they investing in coal, which is going to you know, eventually disappear, when they could be investing in a long-term plan like geothermal? And how would we start that dialogue with them? But we knew that the banks aren't located in Appalachia. They're in New York or London and that we really wanted the local people to be part of leading this struggle. So what actions can the local people take locally? And then we get into discussions about, well, that involves, you know, pickets and, and disruption along the path in, in the coal fields and the extraction and transportation. Um, and that was the part where we started getting into the conversation about, um, like, like, starting that dialogue with workers who are also affected by the issues and talking about, you know, yes, of how does sex. Okay. Uh, workers as community members participating about. We, we also pretty much saw the company as villains. We saw the energy consumers as neutral, but we could possibly win them to our side. We got in the narrative and we were having a real problem. <coughs> Despite all the words here, coming up with a really good narrative. Uh, we were good at talking about the problem, but we did not necessarily have a good story yet for how we could get to the solution. So I was thinking that, you know, this stuff is hard. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, last year, thank you guys. And you guys got two minutes. Sorry. Two minutes. We have a housing foreclosure. Uh, we said that the vision is the story leads to affordable housing. Um, this is kind of an abridged list because there's a lot of actors and stakeholders in this. But, um, we say the movements led by homeless and allies, advocates. Um, you know, people who have experience as a foreclosure, um, probably not the people who have been doing the foreclosure, they would not be um, So there's the human right to, the human right to housing, 
and a key element probably bridging gaps between developers and city officials, banks, and other people. Um, so for values, we said human rights, housing are the moral of the story, which included security uh, of housing, shortability, and dignity for people who are going through the process. Housing and closure. Uh, for the narrative, we did that last, but uh, we say housing security and foreclosure, action paragraphs, and story that always leads to housing foreclosure, and legislative chapters, which goes to our action piece, because we say that um, access to housing opportunities would involve a lot of legislative advocacy. Um, I'm kind of borrowing this idea from the Healthcare for the Homeless Speakers Bureau because they have a lot of speakers that do speaking engagements uh, with people who experience homelessness. In this case, we have testimonies from those who experience housing foreclosure in front of legislation with the effective advocacy. Um, and then building our own alternatives, for example, maybe a symbolic message to have mass being crawled in the name of housing foreclosure to send a message. And then people were finding the right to be housed. Again, that's probably a very rich list of families, single parents, of those who are unemployed. All right, so that concludes um, this workshop. Um, and thank you all so much. And uh, I know it wasn't a lot of time to really flesh it out, and um, but you know, great job. Uh, Great work, and um, yeah. And if you have any questions or whatever, want to talk to Karen, then I will be around, kind of wrapping things up. So, all right, thank you. Thank you.